Hi, it's Mr. Mazurkowitz, and in this video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the origin of life on Earth. Uh, not just the origin of life, but more specifically, the scientific evidence that helps support how we think life got started on Earth. So to kind of kick us off here, I have just a picture on the left. So this is like an artist rendition of what we think Earth looked like at the very beginning, 4.5 billion years ago. And really what our focus is, is how did we get from something like this that we don't really associate with life over to this over here. Uh, when scientists took a look at how Earth formed and we had an understanding of what early Earth was like, there was this question of, okay, well, how do we go from nothing to something? And as good scientists do, we formulate hypotheses and then test these in the lab. And we've come up with some good theories that are supported by overwhelming evidence to kind of figure out uh, how life began on planet Earth. So that brings us to our less than essential question, which is how have scientists attempted to explain the origins of life on Earth? We'll take a look at some of the dominant theories and most importantly, the evidence that supports those theories. Because remember, theories in science are not just these loose ideas. They are supported by overwhelming evidence that really helps us uh, try and understand, in this case, how life began. So here's just a uh, kind of a timeline of early Earth and uh, kind of the evolution of life on it. So uh, if we think of this as a big clock, you notice that 12 o'clock is the formation of the Earth about 4.55 billion years ago. And then uh, over the course of time, we've had uh, the development of prokaryotic organisms where this purple line begins. You can see photosynthesis begins, eukaryotic cells evolve, multicellular organisms, and kind of all these events have unfolded over the last four and a half billion years. What we're really going to be focused on, again, because this is the origin of life, we're really going to be focused on pretty much uh, this point over here, which is how did we go from nothing during this Hadean era, that was pretty much that picture I showed you, to uh, the first life forms, and we'll even touch on the beginning and what we think how eukaryotic organisms came to be um, a little later. But really our focus today is going to be how did we go from nothing to something. So with that question, uh, we're going to start with our first scientist, who is Alexander Oprin. And Alexander Oprin came up with this idea of chemical evolution. Again, he was really kind of focused on how could we go from inorganic molecules on planet Earth. And inorganic molecules are pretty much the molecules we don't think of as forming life. So these are going to be things like uh, water, um, uh, ammonia. Even though methane is an organic molecule, it's a very simple one. These were the molecules that were really abundant during the beginning stages of Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And what he thought was, well, why can't molecules change over time? Kind of like how organisms evolve and change over time. Why can't molecules maybe randomly rearrange themselves to eventually build more complex organic molecules? So things like uh, your carbohydrates, your lipids, your proteins. So he hypothesized that simple molecules, things like the methane and ammonia and water vapor, these things could evolve forming more complex molecules that would go on to form the building blocks of life. And with this hypothesis, we obviously want to test these things out. So Alexander Oprin didn't do so much testing with it, but two people who did were Stanley Miller and Harold Urey. So here on the right are two pictures. On the left here is Harold Urey. On the right uh, was his student, Stanley Miller. And what the two of these did was they took Alexander Oprin's idea of chemical evolution, this idea that molecules can go from inorganic and simple to organic and complex, and they tested it out in the lab. So they tried to explain how Earth's early primordial soup, and this was a term that Alexander Oprin coined, and pretty much what it says is if you think soup as a big liquid, our oceans, primordial meaning uh, before life existed, our oceans were just a soup of inorganic molecules stewing and brewing, um, really not harboring life, but they wanted to show how we can go from this primordial soup to maybe the first um, molecules that gave rise to life later on. So at the bottom here is just a picture of the apparatus that they use, and it's even though it looks complex, it's kind of simple and uh, pretty clever. So what they did is in a flask, they added some water and they had a heat source uh, to kind of simulate what Earth was like, very hot, boiling oceans. Uh, they even introduce those gases, those inorganic compounds, so things like methane and ammonia and the water vapor. And as it went around, they introduced electricity using these electrodes to kind of simulate lightning on early Earth. And they let these things mix, and then they would cool it down to go back into liquid form. And then what they would do is stick these probes inside at certain points. 
and kind of test to see, okay, what do we get when we let this run? And what they actually found was that by letting this apparatus run for a long period of time, they were actually able to create some of the building blocks of life, specifically amino acids. And if you remember, amino acids are the uh, monomers of proteins. So it was really a, a cool breakthrough experiment how we can take inorganic molecules that were found on primitive Earth and create organic molecules, specifically amino acids that we know will go off to build life. So uh, they didn't create life, but they did create the molecules that go on to build life. So once we're able to show how we can go from inorganic molecules to organic compounds like amino acids, we then wanted to figure out how can we go from these things to create, let's say, cells, the building blocks of life. So along comes the scientist Sidney Fox who asks this question. And what he was able to actually do is he took the amino acids from that Miller-Urey experiment and he built off of it. So he subjected those amino acids to similar conditions like we'd find on uh, primitive planet Earth. And what he saw was the formation of these things that he called microspheres, or these tiny little protein bubbles made up of amino acids. Uh, and they had very similar characteristics to cells. So while he didn't actually create cells, he did create things that behaved like cells. Uh, diffusion could occur across their membranes. They could divide. Uh, so it was really another big step showing how we could go from nothing to something. Combining the Miller-Urey experiment, showing us making uh, organic molecules and then using those to create these kind of primitive cells uh, was really an interesting way. So what uh, Sidney Fox concluded that was that maybe these microspheres gave rise to those first prokaryotes that uh, show up in the fossil record about 3.8 billion years ago. So another question that we then are left with is, okay, now that we have cells, we know about the genetic material within those cells, and where did that come from? So what exists is what is known as the RNA world hypothesis, and what that says is that we think RNA existed long before, uh, by itself, before DNA. So what's the evidence to support that? Well, first of all, uh, if you remember, RNA is kind of essential in this whole translation process of making proteins. So without RNA, you can't quite get from DNA over to your protein. RNA is kind of essential. So if we think about a world without DNA, RNA can make proteins. It can encode the message using those nucleotides. RNA is also able to kind of self-replicate. So we can create more RNA from RNA. Uh, we can even use RNA to create DNA in some types of viruses. Um, so we have seen that RNA has all the properties that are essential for life. So we use that kind of evidence to say, well, maybe the world had RNA first, and it wasn't until uh, later that DNA evolved maybe as a more stable version of the genetic code. So everything that we've kind of talked about so far is focused, again, on the origin of life. So we've really been focused on this part of that chart. Uh, we've kind of looked how we can go from that Hadean era of these inorganic molecules to start creating organic molecules, which then go on to create cells, and how we can take organic molecules to maybe create RNA as our genetic code, which goes off to give uh, life to uh, or give birth to DNA. Where we're going to end today is then, okay, well, once we have our prokaryotic cells, where do eukaryotic cells come from? So we kind of just follow this timeline again. About 3.5 million years ago, we saw that photosynthesis began, and that was from these types of bacterial cells called cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are prokaryotes, and they have the ability to do photosynthesis, and what they really did was they changed the atmosphere for planet Earth. Uh, Remember, planet Earth didn't have any oxygen, little to no oxygen. And once these guys came around, they started taking out that carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen gas. Well, it was due to these cyanobacteria that we think maybe this is where we got our eukaryotic cells from. So what we have is a theory known as the endosymbiotic theory. And if we kind of break this word down, endo meaning inside, symbiotic or symbiosis meaning a relationship between organisms. And what this theory states is that chloroplasts and even mitochondria, the organelles we find in eukaryotes, Maybe they were once prokaryotes that were taken in by primitive eukaryotic cells. So we go back to, let's say, that cyanobacteria. So here's my cyanobacteria doing photosynthesis. I'm going to put a C there. What we think is that at some point we had these larger cells that used endocytosis or took them in and kind of formed this mutual relationship where this bigger cell kind of gave it protection and this guy, the mycyanobacteria, would go off to do the process of photosynthesis, creating glucose, releasing oxygen. And they kind of formed this mutual relationship and that would later give rise to chloroplasts. There were even, even other types of cells that were doing a type of aerobic respiration, which is what our mitochondria today do. Another type of bacteria that were doing this process, and maybe they too were taken in by our larger cells and eventually gave rise to our mitochondria. So what is the evidence that supports this? Well, we have a scientist by the name of Lynn Margulis who took this theory and wanted to collect the evidence. And she noticed a couple of things. 
one of the most striking um, pieces of evidence is that chloroplasts and mitochondria both have their own DNA, which is separate from the DNA that we find in our nucleus. Uh, and it's very similar to bacterial DNA. So you have to ask yourself, why would these guys have their own DNA unless they were their own organisms billions of years ago? Another thing that we notice and that Lynn Margulis came across is that they can self-replicate or they do the process of binary fission, very similar to bacteria, where they don't need the host cell to divide. They can create more on their own. So this kind of points to this idea that these uh, structures or these organelles were once prokaryotes. Uh, that were taken in through that in endosymbiosis. So that brings us to the end. If we revisit our lesson essential question, how have scientists attempted to explain the origins of life on Earth? You should be able to summarize all the different experiments and the pieces of evidence that were discussed about where and how life began on planet Earth. If you can do that, I think you're in great shape, and I thank you guys for watching.